Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the conference, uh, weekly conference of the CICAM. My name is uh, Harman van der Ende. I am uh, the main uh, ma member of the main board of the CICAM, and I'm also living on the island of the Schelling. I have uh, black bees, and I wish you uh, very welcome uh, to uh, this conference this week. Uh, and uh, my co-host uh, is John Ellis, and I would like to introduce uh, him. Uh, he will introduce himself, sorry. Uh, and uh, Professor uh, Marina Mikesen, she will uh, also introduce her. So it's my first time, so I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, we will manage uh, today. So hopefully you have a nice conference. Thank you. Thanks, Harman. So, uh, yeah, my name's John Allison. I'm a lecturer at University of Plymouth, and I'm on the scientific board of um, SICAM. And it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight uh, introduce tonight Marina Meixner. So, Marina, I'm sure many of you uh, know her from her many publications in the field, but she has a PhD in biology from the University of Frankfurt. Uh, the topic of her thesis was in the field of biogeography and intraspecific taxonomy of honeybees. Um, and the research was conducted at the Bee Research Institute in Oberursel and supervi supervised by Nico Koeniger and partly also by Friedrich Rudner. And after that, um, Marina did a postdoc position in the US on a topic outside of honeybee research. Um, before returning to work on honeybees, she worked for five years at Washington State University in the field of honeybee selection focusing on local adaptation and varroa resistance. Um, she always had an interest in honeybee diversity and biogeography at the same time, and she's recently expanded research questions on honeybee pathology. And since 2007, she's been working as a senior scientist and deputy director at the Bee Institute in Kirchheim, uh, and it belongs to the State Agricultural Agency of the State of Hessen in Germany. So I'll um, hand over now to Marina and we will enjoy listening to her talk. So thanks for joining us, Marina. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for the very nice introduction. And um, it's a pleasure now for me to report to you the results of a recently completed study on resistant, on varroa resistant honeybees in Europe. And I would ask Harman to please uh, share my presentation because yes, I will, technical I will, glitches, yeah, I cannot do I will, it, but Harman will, will, will do it. Thank you. No problem. So if it's okay, yes. you now see my, uh, and I mute myself, so give me a sign if I have okay. to. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to start. And um, if I may have the first slide or the next slide. I will tell you about the general aim of the study which was actually um, initiated by the commission, uh, the Directorate General for Agriculture and Rural Development of the EU. And the general aim of the study was uh, to explore possibilities for increasing varroa resistance of honeybees that are used in commercial beekeeping. And so the uh, commission uh, initiated a tender call for the study and it came directly from the G DG Agri. And um, Harman, if you can go through the slide very slowly, in the project, we were asked to um, find answers to several questions. For instance, what is the status and the entity of the honeybee breeding and reproduction market in the EU? And what is known about varroa resistance? Do varroa resistant bees exist in the EU? And if they do, are they available for beekeepers to use? Next, are beekeepers even interested in using this kind of honeybees? And if they buy uh, honeybee queens with the predicate varroa resistance, what are they expecting? What methods are available for selection of varroa resistant bees? And do these methods work? And finally, 
what are the efforts to obtain such stock and what are the costs for beekeepers and breeders to obtain varroa resistant honeybee stock? Next slide, please. And here in this slide, I give a brief overview over the team of the Eurobest project. So there were three institutions, LLH, where I work, that was coordinating the study, and then the French National um, uh, Agricultural Institution in RAE, and the Italian uh, National um, Agricultural Institution, CREA. So these three institutions were like the scientific coordinators, and then we had a consulting um, uh, company who was um, in charge of the project management. Um, this body, this core team had to report to the steering group in Brussels um, uh, very frequently. So the steering group consisted of members of the commission. And then finally, we had many scientists and many beekeepers and other apicultural experts who also contributed to the study to various parts. Next slide, please. So in 2017, um, the study was initiated and the tender call uh, came out. And uh, when we won the call, we started with a concept note and the first tasks, market overview and state of play of varroa resistance were completed in 2018. And then we had uh, to set up a huge field study of which I will tell you more in a little while that ran between 2019 and 2020. It was completed last year in the summer. And then we uh, proceeded to analysis and reporting. And finally, we completed the project this spring in 2021 with a huge online conference. Of course, this was all planned differently. The conference was initially thought to be live with about 150 participants from all over Europe, but due to um, reasons we all know about, everything was switched to online. Next slide, please. So one of the first tasks of the project was to assess the EU market for reproductive material of honeybees, because in fact, the EU did not have any data on market or trade uh, with honeybee reproductive material, queens, swarms, packages, and so on. So to get to obtain these data, we used several official data sources, for instance, trade statistics or traces data. And we also used a specific questionnaire that was um, circulated within our scientific network and our epicultural network. And we asked experts in, in all the EU countries um, about um, their, about their um, data on, on these questions. In the next slide, I show you some of the results. So in total, we identified in the EU 2,800 breeders among the 615,000 beekeepers that um, live in the EU where they keep their bees. So a very tiny fraction of beekeepers actually are breeders. So the data source is 2018. But um, the reproductive material these breeders produce actually represents a much higher fraction of um, the honeybee colonies in the EU. So it's uh, more than 2,500,000 queens, swarms, and packages that are traded and um, um, transported every year. Next slide, please. So um, the annual amounts of the produced reproductive material was about 8.8. 1.8 million queens, sorry, about 600,000 commercial swarms and about 100,000 um, package bees. And you can see from the graphs that um, the number of uh, um, uh, reproductive material produced or the amount is very different in the various countries. So you see the countries in the 
in the bottom line in the x-axis, each one with their um, official abbreviation. And on the left scale, you see the number of queens in uh, blue, the blue, the blue columns. And on the right scale, you see the number of swarms and packages, and these are the uh, red and yellow columns. And you can see that only, a, only few countries, for instance, Italy or Poland or France or uh, Spain produce significantly more um, such items as most other countries. So it's a very, uh, very differentiated, very imbalanced, um, um, uh, picture we get here. Next slide, please. And information from surveys and also data from trade statistics show us that the high, the highest proportion of trade is actually within countries. So when we looked at traces data or other data sources, and only a very small fraction of the of the trade uh, of this. Um, reproductive material in the EU is international, is crossing borders. Okay, next slide, please. The second task we had and the second question we had to answer was what is known about varroa resistance in honeybees? Do varroa resistant bees exist and are they available for beekeepers to use? And to answer this, we used a literature survey or a literature review, uh, you can move please, Harmon, and surveys among experts. Next slide, please. So in the literature review, we found that in reality, there is no well-established market for varroa resistant stock in Europe. We, we found several studies that show that environmental factors affect resistance. And we also identified from the literature that um, naturally surviving populations exist, but um, questions arise about their, the quality of their apicultural trace, traits. And in breeding programs that are around resistant traits that are observed in naturally resistant populations are integrated. And in the next picture, you see um, a mating station on the island of Norderney in northern Germany, uh, very close to, uh, to the Netherlands, where um, varroa resistant drone colonies are uh, provided without, um, uh, without conventional um, varroa management, so without chemical treatments, and they, um, they are there to uh, to mate with queens that beekeepers actually uh, bring there in varroa resistant breeding programs. Next slide, please. And in, uh, in this task, uh, we also carried out interviews with uh, scientists and beekeepers who are involved in breeding varroa resistant honeybees. And in total, we asked 48 uh, uh, persons uh, worldwide, so not only in Europe, but also in the US and in other countries. And the questions we asked them was, how do you measure varroa resistance? And we gave them a list of um, traits that uh, they could select um, which ones they used in their kind of uh, breeding. And of course, more than one answer was possible here. Harman, can you please move on a little bit? So in um, the 21 breeders who use naturally surviving uh, populations in their selection program, um, they use surviving as the main trait. And so they, they do this kind of uh, uh, live or let die approach or similar approaches. But there were also uh, 28 people who um, were using um, traits or genetical selection for specific traits in breeding so programs. And so for them, mite infestation development was uh, very important. And also the traits varroa sensitive hygiene and suppressed mite reproduction and hygienic behavior. So these were the most significant traits that um, scientists or breeders are looking at. at. 
And then we did another survey, next slide please, where we looked at the presence of selection programs on varroa resistance across Europe and the availability of a resistant stock for beekeepers. And in this survey, we found that 20 EU countries actually conducted selection programs of one kind or another for enhancing resistance. And six countries reported naturally resistant populations, but in only four countries, uh, we found commercially available resistant stock. So supplies of queens are quite limited in those areas. And several countries have recently initiated new selection and breeding programs, but data are not yet available here. Next slide, please. And then we conducted a third survey among queen customers. So people who buy queens from queen breeders. And we wanted to know about their expectations regarding the quality of the material and their satisfaction with the material that was available for purchase. And we um, sent this uh, survey through the queen producers to their clients. It was available as an online questionnaire and uh, it was also available in several local languages. So not only in English, but also in several other languages. And of course it was anonymous. And in the end, we had almost 400 responses from seven countries. And the next slide shows you the results of this um, survey and on the uh, Left side, you can see answers to the question, how important are the following characters for you? Swarming, gentleness, productivity, and resistance. So the green part of the bar shows uh, the proportion of answers that says, I'm very sad or it's very important. Um, the yellow portion of the bar uh, gives the okay um, or so-so answer and the red portion of the bar says it's not important. And you can see that resistance characters in the very bottom are very important for um, a huge proportion of beekeepers and only a tiny fraction of beekeepers who buy queens say it's not important. And traits such as productivity, gentleness or swarming are not so important in relation to resistance. In the right portion of the graph, you see the answers to the question, how satisfied are you with the queens you can buy? Again, um, relating to the same four criteria and following the same logic with green, yellow, and red saying very important, so, so important or not so important. And here you can see that resistance traits, although it's very important for most of the beekeepers who buy queens, um, they are the least satisfied with the, this, the performance of, of the queens regarding this trait. So you can see that um, there's still a long way to go actually for breeding and for selection to improve this trait. And with more established traits such as gentleness or swarming behavior, the proportion of beekeepers who say we are very satisfied was a lot higher. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, most important part actually of the uh, Europe study was a large field comparison um, study that was broken down into five case studies in uh, seven countries where uh, we tested under field conditions on um, various lines that were supposedly varroa resistant under uh, commercial or field conditions. And so these field studies um, uh, were actually distributed in, in five countries. So it was Germany, and but also with a few apiaries in um, Austria and in Croatia that were coordinated by the German partner. It was France here in yellow. It was um, Poland in uh, brown, Italy in green, and Greece in dark blue. And in each country, we identified queen producers 
who uh, um, produced the queens that were needed for the studies. We had 21 performance testing apiaries that are shown here in red and 85 commercial beekeeper operations that are shown here in black. Um, and in total, um, more than 2,500 queens were produced by the queen producers, the red, um, no, it's not, yes, the red dots. And uh, in total, more than 3,500 3, colonies were tested during this field study. And in the next slides, I will give you a few more details about the testing. So first about the lines that we were, test, we, we were testing in this um, huge study. And we focused on 23 genetic lines that were available and were reported to have some level of uh, varroa resistance by, um, various, um, by various criteria. And nine of those lines came from selective breeding programs that ran through various uh, um, amounts of time. So some, some lines originated from, from breeding programs that had already been running for 10 or 15 or, or more years. But some lines came from programs that only were initiated quite recently. And then, um, the other lines came from natural selection programs or survivor um, populations. In total, we had seven genetic origins, so four different subspecies, Macedonica, Ligustica, Caranica, and Siciliana. And we had three mixed origins, so these were either hybrids or unspecified um, mixes. And some of them actually had some mellifera um, ancestors or roots. Next slide, please. So this uh, field study was co coordinated by the Eurobest coordinating body. And each, um, each country had its own uh, local coordinator who then, or national coordinator, who then uh, managed the queen producers, the performance testers, and the commercial beekeepers in his or her country, and kind of was in charge of collecting all the data and was in charge of um, making sure that all the tests were carried out according um, to the protocols. And about the protocols, I can also say something in the next slide. Oh no, first we look at the criteria. So the criteria we evaluated was the productivity of the colony, so the honey that they, they produced, and then traditional traits such as gentleness, swarming, and overwintering ability. And then we had a variety of varroa specific traits such as mite population growth, hygiene behavior, suppressed mite reproduction, SMR, and specific varroa sensitive hygiene. And then the next slide, I think I come to the protocols, yes. So we had, <clears throat> we did the testing on two different levels. So one level was the so-called performance testers. These were mostly institutional or more advanced um, uh, um, places. And in those apiaries, we were comparing three different Eurobest lines in the same apiary each line with at least 10 colonies. And in these apiaries, um, the uh, colonies were ran without winter treatment against mites. And the focus was on biological traits. So uh, VSH, SMR, hygiene behavior, and so on. And the other level of testing, next slide, please was the commercial beekeepers. So these were commercial operations who only tested one Eurobest line against their own stock, against the stock they normally use. And they uh, applied their normal management. We did not ask them to do anything special or anything specific. We just wanted to know, are these uh, resistant lines or purported purportedly resistant lines better or worse? How do they relate to your own stock? And the focus in this part of the study was on production and manageability. 
So are beekeepers really, um, is, it, is it a good thing for beekeepers to, to work with such bees? Next slide, please. And of course, a, a large study like this needs a common methodology. So each uh, um, participating apiary needs to do things the same way. So in the end, we can compare the data. So we had um, drafted a book of methods with detailed protocols that was um, ve very detailed and available for everybody who was uh, participating. And we also, in the beginning, had some uh, sessions with participants to train and uh, support them uh, if they had questions about how to do certain things. Next slide, please. And now I will show you a few results. So we found that colony strength and development was very, very strongly affected by the apiary. So that is the location where um, the bees were kept. And this, of course, um, consists of environmental components, but also of management components. And we found uh, significant differences between lines also, as in the number of adult bees during uh, the productive season. And we found a very strong genotype by environment effect again in, in this study. And, um, in general, local lines, lines that were kept in the uh, region they originated from were stronger and they usually also had more honey. And this, of course, highlights the importance of local adaptation on colony development. Next slide, please. As to behavioral and productive traits, so gentleness, swarming behavior and honey yield, we also found here that they were significantly influenced by the genetic line and by the apiary. And we found no differences uh, between commercial stock and uh, the Eurobest lines uh, as to gentleness and swarming tendency. So they were just as good or no worse than any of the commercial lines. But we could see in stock where uh, the breeding had been going on for a long time, uh, the gentleness was, was much higher and significantly better. Honey production was very variable and we had some locations where the honey or the nectar year was very good in 2020, but we had others where it was worse. Again, we saw here a strong influence by genotype uh, of genotype by environment interaction. So we saw that local lines had a tendency to uh, produce more honey. And also in the commercial apiaries, we saw a slightly higher honey production of the stock that beekeepers usually used against um, the, uh, the Eurobest lines. But again, performance of lines was better when they were local. Next slide, please. So the survival after one year experiment. So uh, the one year was uh, a prerequisite of the, of, of the commission. They said to test for one year. So one winter, one season, and then finish. Uh, we would have liked to continue it longer, but one year was like uh, the given. And we saw that in the performance testing apiaries, uh, just under 60% of the colonies survived whereas close to 80% of the colonies survived in the commercial beekeeping apiaries. And of course, most of the performance testing apiaries were run without any kind of treatment against Varroa through the winter, but most colonies in the commercial apiaries, of course, were treated as to the beekeepers' um, preferences. Next slide, please. When we look at Varroa infestation at um, the commercial um, apiaries at the end of the study, we could see that although in the beginning their infestation had been slightly higher in the autumn of 2019 and in the spring of 2020, it was the same between beekeepers' own lines in blue and the Eurobest lines in orange. After the winter in the summer of 2020, Varroa infestation of the Eurobest lines was significantly lower compared to the 
beekeepers' own lines. Next slide, please. If we look at the um, mite infestation in the summer in the performance testing apiaries, so uh, those who did not uh, treat their colonies during the entire year, we saw that several of the Eurobest limes had uh, infestation rate that was lower than 3% after one year. And again, here we saw that local lines had lower infestations. So um, in the x-axis here, we see the case studies, DE for the German one, EL for the Greek one, FR for the French one, IT for the Italian one, and PL for the Polish one. And the um, different subspecies are indicated by colors. So for instance, black here are, uh, uh, denotes Carnica, uh, colonies, while green uh, denotes either um, light green denotes Siciliana and dark green denotes uh, Ligustica. <clears throat> and there's a various number of uh, Macedonica colonies in various shades of blue. And you can see huge differences between, uh, between lines in the same case study, but also between case studies. So for instance, in Southern Europe, Greece, France, and Italy, mean infestation rates were higher compared to the countries in Northern Germany and in Northern Europe, Germany, and Poland. So again, we see local effects, but again, we also see that li lines that um, were local had a lower infestation and lines that were selected for uh, a long time for um, increased mite resistance also had lower infestations. Next slide, please. Okay, so in uh, the performance testing apiaries, we also specifically investigated varroa resistance traits, for instance, hygienic behavior, which was um, assessed by the pin test. That was evaluated twice in all performance testing apiaries with a fixed time interval of six hours. So we pierce 50 cells with a fine pin. And after six hours, we come back and look at the cells that have been cleaned or the cells that have not been touched. And in general, again, like in all other traits, we saw uh, environmental and genotype by environment interaction effects. But um, we also saw effects in lines that had been under selection for a long time in that they performed signif significantly better in these traits. Next slide. We also looked at uh, specific varroa um, resistance traits at varroa sensitive hygiene, at recapping, and at uh, suppressed mite reproduction that were also evaluated in most of the performance testing apiaries. I cannot show any uh, uh, details here because it would take us too far. But we could, we could see that environment, so the place, the location where we performed the test, had a strong effect on the expression of all resistance traits. And we could not detect differences between the lines. And our explanation for this is that selection for these uh, very um, special traits is in the early stage. And most, uh, most scientists really only use this kind of trait for uh, a very short time. So it's not enough time has elapsed to see any differences here. Next slide, please. So in the end, we saw very positive uh, relationships staying with varroa, resist varroa resistance traits here. We saw very strong positive relationships between hygienic behavior and varroa sensitive hygiene, but also between hygienic behavior and the brood infestation level and the bee infestation level. So the higher the hygienic score was, the lower was the infestation levels. And also between varroa sensitive hygiene and the recapping trait and the bee infestation. So this had a positive effect or lowering was lowering the bee infestation rate 
And of course, brood infestation levels and bee infestation levels are very strongly positively correlated with each other. Okay, so we conclude that if we um, increase the expression of uh, those specific traits, we may uh, arrive at a reduction of infestation levels of colonies, and it could be worthwhile to pursuing this further. And also hygienic behavior proved a very useful trait that was highly correlating with, um, with the other traits and with infestation levels. Next slide. In the end, finally, we also conducted an economic analysis of honeybee selection. So we looked at all elements of the, call of the bee breeding cycle from performance testing over data evaluation to selection to queen rearing and mating and so on. And we looked at each single element and did a cost benefit analysis as to uh, how rewarding is it to use varroa resistant stock in commercial beekeeping operations. Next slide, please. So first we looked at the co cost of queen production, the total cost, and we did this via questionnaires with the queen producers. And we arrived at, very, uh, uh, at, at a great variation uh, between the countries. So cost, total cost per queen it was highest in France and lowest in Poland with Italy, Greece uh, being sort of an in the intermediate level and the costs in Germany almost as high as in France. Um, next slide. And then we also looked at the sale price for a queen and we found that in some countries, for instance, France and Italy, um, often uh, queens, uh, the sale price would not even cover uh, the production cost per queen so that we have a negative, uh, a negative income here. And uh, um, in, in Greece, the production cost just covered, uh, was just covered by the sale price. And only in Germany, uh, breeders could expect to make uh, actually um, some revenue from selling queens. Next slide, please. We also looked at the costs for colony evaluation for performance testing. And then we uh, found that the average price across all the case studies in Europe was 193 euros per colony for the evaluation cycle. And about 20% of this uh, price goes to the basic performance testing. So that is evaluating gentleness, swarming behavior, productivity, um, and so on. So the traditional apicultural traits, if we expand this to monitoring varroa infestation rates and measuring hygienic behavior via the pin test, another 20% of the total costs goes uh, to this. And then if you look at specific traits that need a lot of equipment and a lot of labor to evaluate them, such as VSH, varroa sensitive hygiene, or uh, suppressed mite reproduction and recapping behavior, these add um, more than two thirds or about two thirds of the total costs if um, they, they are included. Next slide, please. In the end, finally, we did um, a cost benefit estimation for each of the lines that were under performance or that had been evaluated in the performance testing apiaries in the case studies provided or under the assumption that the beekeepers who would buy such a queen would then also use uh, this colony in a treatment free concept. So that means a treatment, a chemical treatment free concept. And um, that took in, into account the, the costs for buying the queen and so on, but it also took into account the um, money that would have to be spent for treatments or, or other kinds of, of management um, specialties. And we found that for some lines actually, so for instance, line B or lines E, J and K, the balance would be positive, so it would be um, uh, beneficial for the beekeeper. He would have a higher income if he used such, such lines. And in, um, in consequence, 
he would not be, uh, it would not be necessary to uh, treat the colonies or not treat them so often. But then for some other lines, such as line Z or line A or line O, uh, the balance would be negative. So such, such queens, such colonies would not meet the expectations and the beekeeper would lose money if he uses them. Next slide, please. So the recommendations uh, we uh, concluded from, um, from the results of the study are in three uh, or are in three main areas. The first one is queen production. Continue, please. So um, it is rewarding for beekeepers to invest in high quality for queen producers, I'm sorry, to invest in high quality uh, um, output and high quality products. It's important next to uh, improve their knowledge, to optimize their production, and also next um, to cooperate with other beekeepers and to network uh, and to cooperate with scientists or breeding centers or um, uh, other um, uh, associations to enhance availability of their stock to beekeepers or the apicultural community. The next area we have recommendations for is the beekeepers themselves. And for them, we say it's very important to look at well-selected stock to invest in um, queens that are worth their money and they're worth their price. And it's also beneficial to invest in local bees because most of our results have shown that local adaptation is really very important and that local bees do better compared to um, bees that are tested or used outside of the area of origin. And the third area we developed recommendations for is the selection progress process itself, I'm sorry. And what we saw here is that lines that have been selected for a long time and had gone through selection for several generations, they had an overall very good performance. So it's worth the money to invest in selection and to long-term look at a long-term perspective and um, high quality queens are really not something you can produce within like a short time. So we need the long-term perspective. The next um, area here is two local adaptations. So selection is best if it's on a regional basis and we cannot expect to have the one B for all of Europe or even for all of one country, because we need to keep uh, in mind that local adaptation is really a very important thing here. And um, we have strong genotype by environment inf interactions. And finally, um, next one. Uh, we saw that uh, we have a number of advanced traits that we can um, look at and we can try to find out mechanisms and we look at varroa sensitive hygiene or recapping behavior and we try to understand the biology and develop it into traits that can be assessed. But in the end, we saw that the comparatively simple trait of hygienic behavior measured by the pin test will, also, will already take us quite far uh, in selection for improved resistance, because we saw that lines that had been under selection using this traits for quite a while um, performed very well. So we can start simple and then develop more advanced things as we go. Okay, next slide, final slide. We also have recommendations for politicians and for public authorities. And the first one is that selection is really a very efficient way to increase productivity and also to improve bee health. It will improve the ability of colonies to cope with environmental and climatic changes that are to come or that are already here. Finally, support of regional breeding programs is needed and, and, and essential to utilize um, the interactions between genotype and environment we frequently see in honeybee performance. So this study again was a confirmation. It was not the first time we have seen this. It was really a confirmation that these interactions exist and they need to be taken into account when 
selecting and breeding honeybees. Next slide. We also saw that uh, the breeding sector depends on scientific support. And especially when we look at new techniques, new traits, or things like breeding value estimation or selection that is based on genetic markers. Breeders and beekeepers need the scientists and the scientific support and scientific studies to um, develop these things further. Next. What we also saw, which was very important, that is that the market structures for honeybee material need to be improved. And we also need to look at um, differences between member states and harmonize uh, breeding cultures or breeding approaches between countries to develop the market further and to um, make a regional um, material also attractive for beekeepers in their own country. Next one. And final one. So we have seen that uh, selection works, but it's really expensive and the uh, costs are really high. And in some time, in some cases, they cannot cover the market price for queens. Um, we would recommend public funding of selection activities that will then enable us to enhance uh, and also to accelerate selection success and make uh, take varroa resistance uh, a step further and on a long-term or even mid-term perspective make such material available for many more beekeepers than it is today. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk. I thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions that may arise. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Marina, for a very interesting talk. We've actually got three questions in the chat already, so I'll work through those from the top. So the first question came from Helen Murray, and she asks about, she's got a question on terminology. Um, when you talk about production of swarms, do you mean colonies? i.e. full hives and nuclei. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we followed the terminology uh, that was sort of given uh, by the US and by, uh, by, by the commission, I'm sorry. And by uh, swarms, we actually mean nu nuclei or small colonies. And wait, yes, and then we had package bees, yes. So swarms, we, we meant nuclei, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Andrew Brown, and he has an interesting question about how do you define local? How many generations does a bee take to evolve into a local bee? Mm. What's the difference between local and Aboriginal? Mm. Mm. That's a very good question, and it's probably not so easy to answer it. So, in, in, and it, the answer may be a different one for different countries in the US. So, some countries still have their aboriginal bee. Uh, some countries are lucky enough not to have um, eradicated their, their aboriginal bee, their native bee, such as Italy, for instance, or Greece or Spain. So these are the lucky ones and uh, some others like Germany or France or the UK, they are not so lucky. They did away with their local bee, with their aboriginal bee a long time ago. And so, for instance, in Germany, Apis mellifera carnica has been kept for the past, well, 70 years or so, starting in, in the 50s of the past century. So this can be considered the local bee. Um, I don't have like a, an, an exact number how many generations it may take, but I, I would think that maybe, I don't know, something like 10, 20 years or so, like a ballpark figure I could give. I, I don't really know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's different in different countries. Yeah. Okay, Can I you. ask a question about that? Uh, because uh, if you import foreign bees or queens, mm. then your locality will be gone or uh, because, you know, I live on an island and we don't import that many bees mm. anymore. So. Maybe yeah, they're hybrid, but they're still local. 
yeah, now it gets really complicated. So uh, I don't think the answer is the same one in, in each country. Uh, it depends on, on various things. Uh, for instance, on how many queens you import, how well they do, how many drones they can make, how competitive the drones are, uh, how big the imported population is in relation to your native one, and, and so on and so on. So introgression is an issue. But for instance, uh, we have seen in a study on the island of Malta that we are right now in or in the process of, of writing it up and publishing. Uh, Malta is, is tiny and it has a tiny native population. And uh, each year, a huge number of queens from Italy uh, comes in because beekeepers like Italian queens or they used to like it, it's, it's changing. Yet we see when we look at the Maltese population of honeybees, we do not see so many signs of introgression in the native bee. And that is because the Italian queens and Italian colonies don't do so well in Malta. So they, of course, they make drones and of course they, you know, there's introgression. But again, uh, Malta is such, such a um, difficult environment for bees that the, there's huge uh, competition. And, and again, we have selection against the Italian genome in a way, it seems like this. So we, we don't see so much. So it really depends on, on many things. And, um, but the take home message is in a way, if you still have your native bee, don't eradicate it, work with it, breed, select and so on and try to make it better. And uh, it will be to your benefit. It will be much better than trying to import something and then form that, whatever it is, into something that does well under your conditions. Okay, thanks, uh, Marina. We, the, the next question comes from um, Norman Carrick. And Norman mm -hmm. says, thanks very much for an interesting talk. Um, what advice can you give to a country like the UK, which lacks an established queen rearing and bee breeding network? Develop one, <laughs> <laughs> develop a uh, working network. I mean, it's, it's a slow process. It's probably painful. Uh, it's probably not so easy, but um, yeah, uh, this is the best advice I can give you. And, now, and, and then try to work with your neighbors, with your fellow breeders and, uh, and, and try, try to go from small to, um, to larger. Okay. It's really the only thanks, Norman, for this for this question. And Norman actually was involved in um, at least in some tasks in the Eurobest study. I should point this out. Okay. <laughs> um, so the next question then comes from uh, Matisse Herremans, who, who asks, uh, "Thank you for the interesting talk. Oh, uh, can we read the full papers and details mm. somewhere?" So. Um, yes and no. <laughs> so there's one paper published, the, the um, uh, literature review that we did to evaluate the state of play of varroa resistant bees in Europe that was published last year in a special issue of the journal Insects uh, with a number of authors. And uh, we are just now finishing writing up an article for bee journals that will soon be published in various countries in various languages. So we have the master version in English that's almost finished. And then it's being translated and published in technical beekeeping journals across Europe. And that should be within say the next months or so, because we just finished the study. Huh? It's, it's really very, very, very fresh. And uh, we are, of course, working towards publishing a number of scientific papers, and that will be taking a little bit more time. So, but, but we're working on it, yes. Right, um, thanks. Next and question. also, sorry, I should, mention, I should mention that in this final conference, that I totally forgot to mention that, the final conference was online in April, but if you go to the Eurobest website, eurobest.eu, uh, Eurobest yes. Um, you can see most of the talks and most of the presentations that, uh, so some had been recorded in advance and some were given live. And so most of them should still be available on, on the website of, of the project and um, could be watched at any time. 
Okay, that sounds great. Um, okay, so a few more questions in the list. One the next question is from uh, Vincent Doir, and he says, thank you for this very interesting point on uh, the resistance situation for productive beekeepers. Oh, uh, that's sorry, it's a similar question. Are you able to share the report of the Your Best project? Mm -hmm. I guess you just answered that, sorry, I should have read ahead. Um, and the second question is, um, how can we explain the better fitness of the local bees and the selection on local breed regarding a hygienic behavior? Um, so regarding hygienic behavior, we could very clearly see that lines that have been under selection for a long time, say 15, 20 years, they did a lot better than, um, than lines that had not been selected. And uh, I think that was even like maybe the one exception to, to like the um, um, prevalence of or, or the predominance of, of local lines. So in, in, I'm not sure I would have to really go back and look at the results. I don't want to say anything, anything wrong, but for hygienic behavior, really lines that have been under a strict selection regime for say 15 plus years we could see effects very strong effects and i think the question with regard to the local selection maybe i could follow up on that so yeah. obviously you said the local bees did um, In general better. local bees always did better and local bees usually also had the better resistance uh uh, performance yes but, um, what do you think the mechanism is that for example i was wondering I could it be you know a local bee is less stressed by the local climate so it can invest more yes. in immunity yes. or those yeah. kind of it, it could be any of this and it's probably um a combined effect of various with various components so it's the local climate it's the nectar flow it's also probably a uh, prevalence of diseases or disease vi variants mm. but it also manage it's also management type and we saw this genotype by environment um, uh, interactions in a number of studies we conducted before so about 10 years ago we did a huge study with more than 600 colonies in 16 countries all over europe and here again, we saw that local lines survived longer and better than any, any imported bee. So we, we cannot exactly explain the phenomenon, but, but it's, it's there. And it's actually something that is also known from other areas of animal breeding or plant breeding or any kind of agriculture. So it's a very known, um, uh, a very known phenomenon, and and it's in bees, it's it's also there. Okay, and um, uh, there, there's a. I'll just jump ahead one question because Alice Pinto has asked a question um, that's a, on that topic. So thanks very much for an interesting talk. She says the finding of a strong genotype by environment interaction is another outcome suggesting that the free trade of commercial bees within EU should be discussed. Do you think that your results could contribute for regulations towards limiting free trade within the EU? Thanks, Alice. Um, um, as you were participating in the final conference, you probably know that we discussed this issue with Kai Uwe Sprenger, who was our um, EU uh, counterpart or, or the person in charge of our project. And um, this is not going to happen. I mean, uh, we, we discussed all kinds of, of restrictions, but it's really sort of. Um, probably the, the best approach is to go the other way around and um, try to offer breeders and beekeepers the best possible bee that is selected under the locally prevailing conditions. And the EU will never uh, do away with the free trade. I mean, if you, if you did not negotiate this upon joining the EU, it's not going to happen, but it's, it's, it's a good question, thanks. Okay, um, I'll just progress through the questions. Andrew Brown has just had, um, added a comment. It's not a question, just to say that malt is a, a real problem here in Plymouth, where we have a re residual population of AMM close by. Um, we have beekeepers in Plymouth importing commercial bees from Malta. Um, so, um, and then um, Pablo Espejo has asked the question. Mm -hmm. um, are the wild swarms naturally selected a reasonable starting point for um, a resistance selection program? 
It could be. Yeah, it, it really depends on your con conditions. I mean, if you are in a region where there's really no selection happening and no breeding, so it, you could start with wild swarms, but um, it, it really, I don't think there's a general answer to this question. And, um, it, it, but it, this could be a, a useful thing, yeah. I, I would like to com comment on the commercial bees from Malta. Of course, these are not the native Maltese bees, but commercial um, Italian or Buckfast bees produced under Maltese conditions um, on the island of, of Gozo um, and, and sold EU wide. So these are not not native Maltese bees, but commercial, commercial, uh, commercially produced commercial queens. Um, there aren't any more questions in the chat right now, but I just uh, while we wait for any more to come in, I had a question. Um, because you mentioned in your talk that most beekeepers want resistant, productive, and, and gentle bees, and then the mm -hmm. evidence you presented suggests that local bees often uh, actually do better in terms of resistance. What do you think we could do as a SICAM to get the message out to more beekeepers that local bees are a really good opportunity to get the resistance that beekeepers want? Because I, I guess there wasn't a question in that survey, how important are local bees to you? Mm, no. do, do you get a feeling about how important <laughs> that is to beekeepers in general? Um, well, we had a question uh, asking the, the beekeepers or the queen customers, why are you buying from this producer? And so the selection or the possible answers were, I know the producer or a friend recommended, or I like the quality, um, it's a regional breed or something like that. So we did have uh, questions in, in this line, but uh, I wasn't able to show the answer here. And actually regional produce, produced queens, regionally produced queens were an argument for, for many beekeepers. So it was one of the Okay. Um, one of the more selected, more often selected answer. Okay, thank you. Um, and there's another question come in from uh, Andrea quickly. Um, she says, so are we saying we go back to the basics, simply select our local bees for well-tempered, healthy stock? Sounds good, yes. And if you include <laughs> hygienic behavior and if you do it long enough, uh, you might arrive. And then, of course, we haven't really talked about anything like mating control or, you know, or, or things like that, or adapt your management. But it could be one of the central elements, yes. And mating control actually is really important. Okay. Yeah, and no, I, I probably can also tell you, which I tell, told you before, uh, on the island, uh, we, we, we don't treat already for five, six years already mm -hmm. anymore. And I always, I don't ever say I have varroa resistance beef, but I can say they uh, can handle uh, varroa. Mm -hmm. So so I can God, not guarantee that if we get them out of the island that they're still varroa resistant. So I, I yep. completely agree with your research that our local bees are... Yep uh kind of having a resistance on uh, on on on, uh, on on varroa and it works i mean mm. i never have to treat my bees anymore uh, and, and mm. we don't imp we only import maybe two or three there's always one beekeeper who starts still imports some but we we if we look at the uh bees and we're in a survey with uh, with dylan Allen. That, that there is no regression, what you said, of our bees uh, for those few bees we have, uh, we have 250 high. So, so, so what you say is, is it feels really, really like we have it uh, the same, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, so it's, it's great. If it, if it works under your conditions, it's great. And, but of course, as an island, you don't have to worry about mating control because you have a natural, a natural situation where mating control is just in place. And um, you can limit introgression, so that's good. So you can limit importations, and uh, and and probably the your bees may not do as well if you take them to another place. And especially in in traits like varroa resistance, we have seen that frequently. That lines that were highly praised uh, in some in some areas when we took them to to a different place, to a different region, to a different apiary, um, they were not as good and they were not as resistant as um, we, we had exper expected. 
Oh, so so that is uh, reason enough to keep your local bees yeah. where you, they are. <laughs> yeah, I think. And, and I mean, regional regional selection programs are the key. I think. Yeah. And I think we can we can take region really a little bit wider, so we don't really go to small small each village, but like each like geographical vegetational region, say the lowlands or um, the mountainous areas or Central Europe with like a more continental climate or a maritime climate, something like that, like the the wider region, and and that that should work. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got one, uh, I think uh, it's after seven, so uh, we've, we've got one more question, so I guess we make this uh, uh, the final question before we say uh, good evening to everybody. Um, uh, it's another question from uh, Vincent Doir, and he's, he asks about natural selection. Could natural selection be a key mechanism to get resistant honeybees? Yeah, we have seen that in, in some... Uh in some examples in the past, and there's quite a few famous um, famous uh, bee populations. So the Gotland bees, for instance, in Sweden, or the, the Avignon bees in southern France, uh, that are considered um, the result of natural selection, where beekeepers did not interfere and just let the bees, you know, be bees and do their thing. And it's, it's the survival of the fittest. Of course, such colonies or of course the result of such selection will be resistant bees at some point. The question is more, will you want to work with them as a beekeeper because they may have evolved traits that you don't like. So they may make very small colonies, for instance. So we know this from Gotland, but also from Avignon that colony, average colony size an average brood nest size is much smaller than you <gasps> wanted or you prefer to have it as as a beekeeper and that the same goes for productivity and honey yield and things like that and of course the moment you stop selecting for gentleness gentleness will disappear so you may end up with horribly stinging colonies so if you can live with that and if you are in a place where your neighbors can live with that so that's fine but you won't make much of an income with such bees okay well thanks uh, marina thanks for a fascinating uh, You're very welcome, talk. thank um, you. Uh, thanks for joining us here, and uh, thanks to Harman for hosting you. this evening. And uh, yep. I guess uh, thanks to everyone for their attention and their interesting questions. Thanks so. a lot. Yeah, bye bye. Uh, Have a good evening. Next week. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye. bye.